Namaste. Uh, it's a rainy, windy, blustery morning. Good time to be inside making a video. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to skip a couple of verses, two or three verses ahead, because those all say just about the same thing. In fact, when I was preparing these videos and I read the two previous verses, I thought maybe there was a misprint and the same verse had been repeated because they're almost identical, even the Sanskrit. So they don't really add any new information. So I'm going to skip ahead to the next verse, which talks about the transition and the relation between waking and dreaming consciousness and how actually it's all just a case of mistaken identity, like the guy who thinks he's Napoleon, right? <laughs> In him are those nerves called hita, which are as fine as a hair split into a thousand parts and filled with white, blue, brown, green, and red serums. They are the seat of the subtle body in which impressions are stored. Now, when he feels as if he were being killed or overpowered or being pursued by an elephant or falling into a pit, in short, conjures at the time through ignorance whatever terrible things he has experienced in the waking state, that is the dream state. And when he becomes a god, as it were, or a king, as it were, or thinks, this universe is myself, who am all. That is his highest state. So here we're looking at the man in the dream. And in the dream, he has access to all of the memories from many previous lives. And these are encoded into a network of these nerves called hita, and different colored serums just refers to the different qualities of those impressions. Now, uh, we have done research work a, little, a long time ago, back in the 1960s and 70s, that definitely proves that impressions are stored in the bodily organs, not necessarily in the brain or even in the mind, except when they become relevant to the present situation. Here's how it works. Assume that these colors of serums described in the nerves are actually code for different qualities or gunas of material nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance, and different mixtures of those modes. Okay, so then if impressions come in, to that part of the body. You know, let's say a man gets hit in the stomach. So the nerves in the stomach muscles and organs behind them are going to interpret this hit as a threat, of course, because they have memories of being hit before. So in order to avoid injury, they raise an alert and it's the alert that pops up in your awareness. Huh? If you've ever actually been injured, like in sports or in a car wreck or something, you know it doesn't really hit you right away, the actual condition. But an alert goes up for sure and says, you know, something's really wrong. You have to do something. That's the first thing you're aware of. Only later do you become aware of any bodily injury or anything like that. And that's how the body protects itself actually from harm. By giving an alert to the brain saying, get out of here, <laughs> get out of this situation. And then holding back the actual pain, including the memory of the pain, until you can handle it, until you can process it. This is the way nature has developed us. So anyway, when a person goes into a dream and due to the karma in previous lives, they remember something painful that happened. These memories are encoded already in the relevant organs. It's as if the mind consists of a tree structured database based on the modes and qualities of material nature and events. 
And every time impressions come in, it does a quick search and pulls up those memories that are similar in quality. So in other words, if you had a previous traumatic experience, whether it's in this life, early in this life, or even in a previous life, the memory of that is encoded non-verbally, unless the incident also contains words, and indexed in a tree structure according to quality. So when something like that happens again, the mind throws up an alert and it's a body feeling. As you know, if you've ever been actually injured or maybe involved in martial arts or stuff like that, where there really is a question of bodily injury, then you'll know that before your brain registers anything, your body knows. This is called instinctive knowledge. And it's something, unfortunately, we have been trained out of by modern culture, which relies too much on language. And so when the language breaks down, like when things happen too fast, because language is slow, you know, speech especially is slow, not many bits per second bandwidth. <laughs> Well, we lose track of the situation because we can't follow it. Our mind running language is not as quick as the physical world running physics. <laughs> so we can get faked out. We can be deceived. We can be tricked. We can be led astray. We can be made to think that white is black or black is white. It's actually true simply by words, by conditioning, by propaganda, see? And then we take these propagandas, these descriptions, these verbal descriptions into our minds as impressions that contain words. And if those words match up with the physical descriptions in other impressions previously uh, in file in the mind, they get filed in the same folder or drawer. So when things happen that resemble those past events, it recalls them. It's an automatic mechanism. And if there appears to be any danger, then you get an alarm from your instinctive awareness. And then later on, maybe the understanding will come. What does this have to do with waking and sleeping? Because when we are sleeping, and to a certain extent, while we're awake in the realm of thoughts, which is also Swapna consciousness, things can come up that resemble previous events in which there was harm, pain, negative emotion, or uh, verbal trauma, communication problems. So then we get an alert for it, even though actually in modern civilization, the situation more or less, I mean, more often is not going to be physically threatening, but it might be mentally or emotionally threatening, and that's also a reason to be alert. So the mind misinterprets, or I should say overemphasizes the degree of the alert because our living conditions have changed. And after who knows how many million years of adaptation, I don't want to say evolution, but adaptation of the human body to you know, the world we live in, this comparatively recent condition of ease and comfort in civilization, <laughs> like Gandhi said, he was asked, well, what do you think of Western civilization? He said, I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> he was referring to cow killing specifically. So anyway, if we ever get to an actual civilization, that would be nice. But even the one we've got is a heck of a lot better than being a hunter-gatherer in the woods where you're constantly exposed to physical danger. So we are living in an age of ease and comfort, which, you know, I'll, I'll talk about later. It's temporary, but uh, 
when we get ourselves in any situation that looks like it might be dangerous, the mind will alert. Huh? The hippocampus will fire and uh, the whatever it's called, the axolotl, the, the lizard brain, <laughs> will go off and panic. And you'll get fear chemicals in the bloodstream, which if you eat meat, by the way, you already have in abundance of fear chemicals and alarm chemicals from the food you're eating. But then it'll set off the endocrine system and you'll get even more. So you become like panicked over nothing, over words, isn't it? Haven't you all experienced this? Somebody will say something that triggers you and boing, you're in this completely uncontrolled state of mind or especially emotions because the intelligence is in the heart. The intelligence is the one that reacts once it knows the actual situation. You know, this is after the biological alert has already passed. So it's often the intelligence that has to like tamp down the fire and say, hey, 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 cool it, you know, chill out. It's not really that bad. So a person in ignorance is not aware of their actual identity. See, this is where the mistaken identity theme comes in. A person in ignorance does not know that they are the self. <laughs> Even though they are the self, they don't know they're the self, and they don't recognize themselves as the self. They think, I'm Joe Blow from Kokomo. I am this body. Huh? And it's just like the poor nutcase who is pretending to be Napoleon. <laughs> right? Which is a famous... Um, I haven't seen it recently, but in back in when I was growing up, it used to be a standard trope for someone who is mentally ill, right? The guy is in the nut house, and even in he even he's at, whoops, and even he's in a straitjacket, and he's still got his hand in his, in his coat, you know, like Napoleon. Anyway, it is a type of madness to think that I am this body, I am this mind. This body is telling me the truth about the world that really exists. See? And so on and so on. All of the computations and derivations of those assumptions are actually very dangerous because they lead to the construction of a society based on false assumptions and premises, which we have now. Huh? which is unsustainable, which is damaging to the planet, which is damaging to everybody on it, and which creates every day hundreds of false alerts, uh, like when we're driving. Driving is one of the most insane, aberrated things on this planet. Look at the way people behave when they're driving. I mean, who do they think they are, you know? Sterling Moss, <laughs> the Terminator. I mean, who do they think they are? They're driving like there's no tomorrow. I mean, literally, for many of them, there won't be a tomorrow. But even for the ones that survive it, my God, the incredible risks they take for such little gain. Now, this is this overcompetitiveness is a symptom of someone who is in a state of constant chronic alert. And why is that? Because their autonomic nervous system, their bodily organs, uh, see all these vehicles, which it probably you know, equates more or less to big animals, running around at high speed, and it naturally pulls up all these past impressions from big animals running at high speed. See, from many previous lifetimes and even lifetimes as not a human being, as some kind of animal. 
Big animals running fast equals danger. Isn't it? In the jungle. So, people get triggered in cars. Not only the driver, the passengers too. And they start panicking and they start freaking out and doing crazy things. Why? It's a case of mistaken identity. In some part of them, they are still back in the jungle in a loincloth trying to get something to eat and here comes a tiger or something. And then that shows up in dreams, that being on alert constantly. It shows up in dreams and it shows up in aberrated thinking. So we accept so many things that just aren't true. You are your body. Knowledge means the regurgitation of phrases learned from beings of so-called authority, huh? which, you know, is, is not knowledge. Knowledge is knowing how to do things. And words are not doing things. Words are just words. So, like, you know, all the people who think you know a dueta when you can talk the talk, the neo adwaitans they think if you can talk, you know, if you can quote from uh, Ribu Gita, you know a dueta. No, you don't. You don't know anything. You don't even know the difference between words and reality, <laughs> symbols and the things they represent. That's where we start. That's where wisdom starts. The Tao that can be spoken is not the true Tao. See, that's wisdom 101. So if you are, you know, like intoxicated on fear chemicals from eating meat and being triggered all the time by driving in fast cars and uh, are in a competitive workplace or a competitive career where you have to constantly, you know, run just to stay in one place, like in Alice in Wonderland, uh, you know, you are sick. You are suffering from mistaken identity. You don't understand that you are the self and that the self is never affected by any of these movies. See, the stuff that happens in the world is just a movie. And you perceive it through the senses, just as the same as if you were in a cinema house. And what to speak of dreams. <laughs> dreams are like weird science fiction movies, you know, weird existentialist flicks uh, from Europe <laughs> with no discernible plot. <laughs> I'm sorry, you know, but this is not civilization. In civilization, you have a clear, <laughs> clear understanding. What is a human life? What is the value of human life? What is the aim of human life, the purpose of human life, and what we should do to attain it? But that is not true of the present uh, culture, society, gang, mob <laughs> currently on this planet. So that's why we spend a lot of time and effort in trying to educate people as to what is the real nature of the self. Because if you understand that aham brahmasme, I am Brahman. Tattvamasi, then you are Brahman then nothing can ever happen to me and you because we are one. See, if you hear the Vedic expression, uh, sarva kalvidang brahma, then you know actually everything is brahman. So I am not different from any of this. I am all of this. And certainly from the point of view of consciousness, Consciousness is everything.
Without consciousness, there wouldn't be anything. So, you know, this is the fundamental piece of actual knowledge, actual understanding, actual identity. To know that I am Brahman, you are Brahman, the table is Brahman, you know, the sky is Brahman, everything is Brahman. And to know how you are invulnerable, you are invincible, you are actually, you know, unkillable, uninjurable. Of course, that's not true of the body or mind. So this is a problem then. How to resolve this mistaken identity? In the beginning, it's through knowledge. Yeah, you do have to hear the words. You have to ideally or ultimately hear from someone who actually knows, who actually lives according to this knowledge. Then you can begin to get not only an intellectual but an emotional understanding of who I really am. See? And of course, you know, the, the thing that is really a clear and present danger is the likely... Uh, implosion of the materialistic culture in the near future. And there are many factors driving it. Climate change is number one. Economics is another one. Politics and, you know, military calculations is another. Defense, they call it. No, it's not defense, it's offense. <laughs> it's offensive, you know. Planning, sitting around planning how to kill more people, you know, uh, per hour or uh, per missile or whatever, is, is bonkers by definition. It's horrible. So these people are mad. They think they are their bodies. And they think that, you know, the score, the, the game that they're playing is that the score at the end of your life of, you know, how many people you killed, how many nations you conquered or whatever is what matters. And they, they have it completely wrong because of this mistaken identity. All their incentives are misaligned with reality. <laughs> Don't even get me started on financial stuff. So the whole thing is just a house of cards. It's like a verbal Jenga stack, you know? And uh, there's a really interesting book called The Failure of Complex Systems. And to me, it's right up there with Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, uh, as far as insight. He's talking about computers, but the same rules apply. Uh, basically, when you have a very complex system, the outputs are not predictable from the inputs. This is called emergent behavior. So in any complex system, you also have this fundamental characteristic of emergent behavior, which uh, Nassim Taleb calls black swans. A black swan is a whammy that comes out of nowhere and whap, you know, smack <laughs> right in the kisser. <laughs> so you have to be prepared for this because they happen with relative frequency in any complex system. Huh? Those of you who are in the computer business, um, what happens when a server stack melts down? <laughs> One error in some small, unimportant subroutine causes another error in a more important routine, and so on and so on and so on, until the whole thing just becomes a seething mass of bits. <laughs> Binary code doing nothing. Then you just have to shut the computer down and build the whole thing up again from scratch. There is no other way to deal with it. So the same thing happens in civilizations. 
uh, culture will go along for a while and it'll appear to be successful and, and have a, you know, a good system going on. And then one day, some little breakdown somewhere in some, you know, unimportant part of the system through a coincidence or whatever leads to a cascading series of failures up to and including the entire system itself. And this can happen to any complex system at any time. Now, it happens when we move, or apparently move, it moves and it thinks and it moves, huh? thinks and it shakes. It shakes, it vibrates between sleep and waking, sleep and wakings. Huh? Now, an Advaitin, a, a, a Jivan Mukta, to, to his vision, it's all sleep, it's all dreams, it's all movies. It all doesn't matter in the end. So don't get all worked up about it. But to a person who is in conditioned consciousness, it's real. It's happening to me. Ah! Right? So the only cure for this is detachment. The only way, for example, the only way you can see a flaw in any system is to not be part of the system. See, the reason I can uh, speak critically, not in the negative sense, but in constructively, you know, constructive criticism. The reason I can speak constructive crit critically, constructively critically about Western society is because I'm outside of it. I can look back on my experiences when I was inside that, and to a certain degree I am today. I'm in the tourist bubble, you know, and all kinds of stuff is available that's not generally available on the island and, and so forth. And I'm enjoying that, you know, it's a, a source of comfort. But man, I've lived rough in India. I've lived on the, on the street or on the road in India or on the trains, you know. Uh, I'm ready to like give up all that anytime. I've done it before and hey, look, I survived because I know how to do it. <laughs> you have to have the chops, you know. Um, but anyway, when one moves from so-called waking to so-called dreaming, from one movie to another, there is a breakdown of the system. One system called waking consciousness fails, uh, usually due to lack of input. And another system called dream consciousness or sleeping, dreaming while sleeping comes up. And uh, the, the way to integrate them is to create a dream while you're awake and then follow that dream into sleeping dream. See, I always save the real tips for the last. <laughs> that way, only the people who watch the whole video get it. <laughs> but it's not, it's not that I'm cynical and, and I'm planning this. That's just the way it works out because it takes that long to establish the context that allows me to say that. See? So anyway, um, the method of going from waking to sleeping is very important because that establishes like the stage, the set for your dreams. I see it actually when I go to sleep, when I finally lay down at the end of the day and close my eyes, first I detach my mind from the senses, which I can do because I've had, you know, decades of yoga and meditation. And there's a, a, an interval in between where I can almost literally see like a stage, a, an empty stage. Huh? I mean, there's no curtains or anything like that. But the lights are there. The lights of the self illuminates the stage of the dream consciousness. 
And then at some point the dream takes over and I'm swept away. <laughs> but the thing is, it gives a nice smooth transition from waking into dreams without setting off too many alarms in the system. That's what keeps people awake at night. That's why they can't sleep. That's why the average American gets, what is it, six hours sleep or something like that, six and a half? Not much sleep. Um, not enough sleep to completely process all the dream material. So you're all, always going to be left with, uh, uh, how can I say, like loose ends going into waking. And then the loose ends of waking tend to carry over into sleep and causing anxiety and negative emotions, which leads to insomnia. So the best thing is to have enough time to dream, have enough time to sleep, have enough time to process everything so that you can step back from it and say, okay, this is just a movie. This is not myself. This is not who I am. It's not even real. I'm just the watcher. I'm the seer. I am that by which everything is seen. And, oh yeah, I wanted to read this one quote, which comes up in the purport to this verse that um, refers to the ultimate state. Because when there is duality, as it were, then one smells something, one sees something, one hears something, one speaks something, one thinks something, one knows something. But when to the knower of the Brahman, everything has become the self, then what should one smell and through what? What should one see and through what? What should one hear and through what? What should one speak and through what? What should one think and through what? What should one know and through what? Through what should one know that owing to which all this is known? Through what, O oh Maitreyi, should one know the knower? Aung Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum Aum Namah Shivaya.